Right, good yeah. morning, everyone. Um, it is a real pleasure and a privilege. Uh, we've got Alexis Pritchard with us today. And you would have seen her live and you would have seen her in the flesh had we not mm -hmm. um, been on lockdown. But Alexis was going to be our guest speaker for our mother son breakfast, which we know a lot of you were looking forward to and a lot of your mums were looking forward to as well. We are really thankful that she has agreed um, to do part of your presentation in a bit of Q&A um, on Zoom um, as a recording, which we'll put on our YouTube, uh, rather than seeing her in person. So it may not be as good as having you in person, Lex, but I think we've probably got the next best <laughs> thing. Um, and just a little caveat before we start, this is supposed to be a mother and son event. So if you're watching this and your mum's downstairs and you're upstairs or whatever it may be, go and grab her, sit next to her on the sofa, uh, make her a cup of tea, uh, whatever you need to do. and do something nice with your mum. I think that was the intention and we want to keep that going. So hopefully um, that's something you can, you can definitely do and make it a nice family event. Um, and that's what we would have done if we could have done it that way. Anyway, so what we want to do is um, introduce Alexis Pritchard. She is our guest speaker, as I've just mentioned, and she is um, a high profile athlete um, in her own right and has done a lot of things um, with her career that we think um, some of the message will, will be really strong. So I'll just introduce her formally. Alexis Pritchard is an Olympi Olympian. She is an Olympic boxer. She's a Commonwealth medalist. Uh, she is a qualified physiotherapist. She's the four-time New Zealand boxing champion. She is a performance and mindset coach. She is an entrepreneur. She is a business owner. Anything else, Lex? Any more hours in the day to fill? Ah, oh, that's probably enough for now. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, but as you can see, a lot of credentials, um, a lot of knowledge, a lot of expertise, and um, some really great experiences. So we do want to hand it over to you um, in a moment, Lex. But it is Mother's Day, so how about we start with um, a little story or a message for your mum, and it's someone I know you, you love talking about. So anything yeah. there that we could start with? My mum is an absolute legend. She, um, what would I say? She taught me how to be courageous. Honestly, she, she did. I was born in 1983 in South Africa. She was a single parent. Um, my father had not necessarily wanted a family, but my mum decided that she was going to go ahead and have a little girl, despite what may come and not necessarily having a whole heap of stability she was actually still and she was in her last year of nursing school so she told me the story of when i was about six or seven months old she was like having me in her arms while she was studying for exams at the same time um so she really faced life with courage and she tried her utmost and she still does. I mean, you know, at 63, she ran her first half marathon. I mean, seriously, this yeah, woman, yeah. she just never ceases to amaze me. And um, we moved here to New Zealand in 2000. Again, a decision for her that had to be ultimately courageous and brave. She knew no one here. We didn't necessarily have a stable job here, but she was like, right, I'm, we're moving so that we can create a different life for us, so we can be in a different, in a better situation. So my mum is courageous and she has taught me that and I now appreciate it looking back. I'm just like, wow, I am wowed by her. When we first moved here, um, she was a, a nurse for an agency. We didn't have a, a house, we were living in a hostel. The two of us were sharing a one bedroom little flatty thing with shared bathroom shared kitchen yeah. accommodation in Grafton and we didn't have a car so if she worked the night shift so not nurses the afternoon shift is like 12 till I don't know 11 so if she was finished at 11 o'clock she would walk home from wherever she was because she was like I, I'm not sure if I can afford a taxi um, and there weren't any buses running at that stage and so she would just be like wow this is what I've got to do for my family I've I've got to work and if I have to walk home in the middle of the night, I'll walk home in the middle of the night, you know, alone in a new country where we had no support. Um, so as a, as a 34 year old now, 36 year old woman, I can understand the amount of courage that it would have taken for her to do all those things for me and for us. Um, and so 
I have so much adoration for her. Yeah. And, yeah. and when you, when you mention that courage, it's almost like you're, you're getting an apprenticeship in courage from your greatest sort of role model and significant other, maybe not knowing at the time that it was happening, but mm. um, I know from speaking to you previously, it's something courage is something that certainly stood you in good stead um, throughout all of your professional uh, sporting background and now you, your business side of things. So yeah. um, that's an amazing, <laughs> an amazing story and an amazing start to your time in New Zealand. Um, and I'm hoping that we can just fast forward a bit and maybe bridge those, those two um, where we're at now or what, sorry, where you've been recently yeah. and, and where you were um, in some of those difficult moments. So I want to take you to, you are walking out into the Olympic Games. You've, be, you've been selected. Um, you're about to represent New Zealand. Um, what are you thinking? What are you feeling when you're on the biggest sporting stage that you could ever have imagined um, or that exists. Um, what are some of the emotions, thoughts, feelings at that time for you as a, as a professional, sorry, as an amateur boxer um, with that silver fern on your back? For me, the, one of the most memorable times was actually just before, a few days before I competed and walking out into the Olympic Stadium with all the New Zealand team in the march through. Um, that was the moment that I was just like, wow, I'm here and this is real. Um, there was a moment just as the flame was lit and they shot confetti into the air and it was just falling all around us. And I was just like, this is real. This is actually real. All that hard work that we have done and all the hours that we put in is, is here. Um, that was probably the moment that I was like, wow, this is real. Mm. Um, and then there was another lovely moment walking out, arriving into the New Zealand team village. Um, you are ferried across to the New Zealand house. So where all the New Zealand team athletes sleep for the night and live essentially for the two weeks. And you walk towards everyone. Everyone is standing in front of you. Your New Zealand team is standing in front of you and they welcome you into the team. Um, I, you know, I was born in South Africa and I didn't necessarily understand a lot of Maori culture, um, but they performed the haka in front of us. And I just absolutely burst into tears in that moment. It was, um, it's making me tear up now, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That me was too, a me too a little bit. <laughs> that was um, a really powerful moment. I felt like I was home. Um, so being in London, across the world from everyone else, I felt at home with my New Zealand team in that moment, and I felt safe. So I think for me, the first thing was that ability to feel safe in a new country with a whole heap of new people around me. Um, that was the start, I think, of a pretty awesome campaign. Um, and then for the first time walking out into the arena, I think it was the O2 arena, if I can remember correctly. And there were 10, about 10,000 wow. spectators, yep. um, the biggest arena I'd ever been in to compete. Um, I am a little bit of a, a big game fighter. Um, I was more nervous for a fight that I had six months earlier at the ABA, which is a local, a local venue in Auckland um, where I felt actually sick with the nerves but walking out in London was just I was like I'm here this is what this is what I mean to do and I'm going to face this thing head on no matter what the outcome is today um, I am going to face this thing with courage and face it with joy um, because if I don't enjoy it what am I doing here so courage and joy really have been something that have always been with me. And that's how I've um, navigated this whole career is face it with courage, enjoy what you're doing and just try and be better than you were yesterday, a tiny, tiny bit. Yeah. Um, and the outcome of the fight was a pleasure. I, <laughs> I won my first fight, yeah. which was incredible because the girl that I'd, Four was the world number two, number three at the time. She had beat me 
in Tunisia three months earlier. And I was just like, you know, had I been fixated on the outcome, I think I would have been a very different outcome and performance. Um, but the idea of, of being focused on how I wanted to box was the most important thing. And I wanted to box with courage and enjoyment. And I certainly did. She was quite surprised um, by what happened. And I was just over the moon, really. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that, I believe, that you, you then became, that was the first time a, a female had ever, a New Zealand female uh, had ever won a boxing match at an Olympic Games. So there's history to be made there. Um, and, and with regard to you being, when you say, a big game fighter, um, and, and that idea of the, or that notion of courage and joy, is that something you feel you've had to build up to and learn? Or do you think so, that's something that's always been inherent in you as a person? Um, is there any insights you could give um, anyone watching now? Um, was it part of a journey or was it just something, hey, this has always been me. I've always been, you know, wanting the, the joy and the, and the courage. Hmm. I think I've been, um, I was one of those little girls that always did things that wasn't what little girls did necessarily. Um, I was still, I still bel did ballet and dancing and all that stuff, but I was also climbing trees barefoot and falling out of trees. Um, so I was a, a child that had quite a strong mind and I was going to do what I was going to do. And then I think also, you know, having those strong females around me, my mum included, or in particular, who approach things with courage. And I could tell sometimes that they were afraid to do something, but they were like, why? We're going to do this anyway, because it's important to us. And we want to push ourselves a little. It's important to push and see what you're actually made of. Um, so... Courage has definitely been part of my life, but it's also something that I have continued to develop and grow and pursue as I have grown older and not necessarily wiser, but just older. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a muscle. I, you can equate it to your courage muscle. It's just like you work out for getting better vo2 max you have to work out to get to be more courageous and so the way i've approached this is looking and seeing what's in my environment that is scary or that i feel a little bit adverse to and i'm like well what's going on why are those feelings coming up and it's like oh it's fear so fear is not necessary you know, in the way that we now feel fear, there's two ways that we can have fear. It could be real fear. It could actually be a dog chasing you with really sharp teeth and you could be in danger. Your life could be in danger fear versus getting up in front of speaking in front of people. That is just our internal fear because of perception, because of judgment. So if it's fear around perception and judgment, what are people going to think? I'm not good enough. All those sort of that internal dialogue that sometimes goes on, that's the fear that I like to go after. For me, that is where courage lives, is going after that fear. And you start out little and then you just grow it and grow it and grow it and grow it. Um, so public speaking is not something that I was very comfortable with up until eight years ago. Maybe no, six years ago is when my, got, my godmother's mum, my godson's mum, gosh that was a mouthful yep, we got um, it. All right. she got married and she was like Lex you're going to be the maid of honor and I was like no I'm not because I have to do a speech and she's like yes you are because you're my best friend so just suck it up um, and so I was like well how do I overcome this fear well I have to make a plan don't I so the plan was get involved with a, a course do a course get some expert knowledge and advice around this thing practice and then execute. So you can't just face something without a plan and preparation. Otherwise, you're just being reckless. I don't think you're being courageous. So um, that's how I approach all the things that are that make me afraid: is prepare, plan, talk to an expert, execute. Yeah. yeah. 
Brilliant. And I think all of our boys and probably some of our mums and dads and families listening, they can equate that feeling to anything, whether it's fear of exams that some boys have coming up, fear of, like you say, presenting or speaking, but everyone's got that something that really, you know, takes them right out of their comfort zone. And some of the, Absolutely. some of the work, you know, some of the strategies and techniques you've mentioned around planning and goal setting is, is really, really important. Mm. Um, I also, I think what we should also add on to that is, maybe investigate why there is that fear so what is what story are you telling yourself yeah um so a slightly different example for me was uh writing a blog honestly blogs have been around for a long time now yeah. hundreds and thousands of people write blogs um and you know in my opinion not all of them have something interesting to say but they still write it because they Feel that they have something to say of value and that's fantastic and um, I'm pretty freaking proud of them for doing that for me I, I didn't do it for a very long time because I was afraid now what was I afraid of well as an eight-year-old my teacher Mrs. Morton who was very lovely she told me uh, Alexis you need to work on your spelling now this was helpful information great feedback from my teacher because yeah I did need to work on my spelling but, you know, over the years, I turned that into a really nasty story. I turned it into a story that was, Alexis, you're no good at English. You're no good at languages. You, um, this is not your thing. Absolutely not your thing. So, therefore, as an adult, you know, you can't write blogs. You can't write. What are you thinking about? Like, don't be ridiculous. So, all about two years ago, I for the first time thought about why that fear was there. And that's the story that came up for me mm. that the little eight year old girl was afraid that she was bad at spelling. Um, and it turned into a nasty story that, that was with me for 20 years. And the only way to overcome that was to sit down and write. And I wrote about the fact that I was crappy at spelling. Yeah. Um, yeah. So investigate where your fears are coming from when they do pop up, that might help you um, to overcome them as well. Yeah, brilliant. And just, I mean, that's really uh, unbelievable information. And I think we do all carry things with us, Lex, from our childhoods and even comments where people meant well, like you need to improve your spelling, but you sort of <laughs> twist it into a different story and it takes on a world of its own. When you work as a performance and mindset coach, mm. is there any sort of um, specific techniques or strategies um, that you do with people that would you could share with some of the boys that are listening or um, some of the families that are listening because I think we'll all have things that we're carrying that we know that they're scaring us uh, yeah. but we don't but we don't necessarily always know how to sort of turn the fear into something productive as you have in many of your situations. Okay so um, one of the techniques that we do is we sort of question, we question the fear, we question the doubt, we question the idea of not being good enough for whatever it is. And so the first question is, you, you have your statement. So my statement, I'm not good at spelling. That's my statement. Now I then go, is this true? Well, there's only a few words that I can't really spell and I can spell a lot of other words. So therefore, no, the statement isn't actually true. So no, it's not true. Um, then the next question is, is it a hundred percent not true or a hundred percent true? And you're like, well, there's aspects of it that I can't do so well, but there's a lot of aspects that I can do well. So no, it's not a hundred percent true. I, I, I can spell what then the third one is what is an example of that fact not being true. Well, I can spell difficulty and I can spell Mississippi. And so those are big words that I can spell. Okay. So therefore I can spell it's the opposite. And then lastly, what would life would be like without that fear? Well, for me, for that particular thing, and we're like, well, I can write blogs. I would write blogs. I wouldn't be afraid to do that. And so go through those questions and question your fear, question your belief. Um, maybe if you need to add in the question, where did it come from? Where did it start? Um, 
why is it there? Because I think unpacking unpacking it is really important. I know that people I say people will say, oh well, that's a silly fear. Well, yeah. Now that I look back at it, yeah, it was a silly fear. Um, but I was holding onto a narrative that had been with me for decades and decades and decades. And so I had to figure out how to unpack it and how to validate the fact that the statement that I had created wasn't correct. There was a flaw in my statement. Um, but what we tend to do is we just stick to that 1% of the fact, yeah. you know, it's, we are absolutely ridiculous in those cases. Um, the same with public speaking. It was stemmed back to primary school when I got nervous speaking in front of the whole class and I'd mess up. Um, but then I unpack it and I was like, well, you didn't really prepare very well for those things ever. Um, and everyone else is also a little bit scared. How do we overcome this? And the only way we overcome this is by being courageous. Um, was that helpful? Did that help? Those it was questions? for me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, it is, um, you know, you can, when you mentioned there about to what percent is it true? I think it is too easy to fixate on the, you know, the 5% when 95% of it is good or right or whatever it may be. That's really important. But I think to do that and, and what you've demonstrated throughout your career is to, to have that open mindedness to ask those questions. You need to be strong and positive character. Um, and I know obviously character is something that we talk about frequently at our school. Mm. Um, and I know it's been a, a really important cornerstone of everything you've achieved. Um, I was just keen to get some of your thoughts around character building, character tests, um, when your characters really stood you in good stead or not. Mm, yeah. um, just some of those examples and stories from all walks of your life would be really insightful, I think. Um, I was just sharing with, with you earlier, Andrew. I was just listening to a podcast with, with Wayne Smith, our former, no, our assistant coach of the All Blacks, maybe coach to be. And um, I agree absolutely with the statement that he made that character is built um, and the greats always have good character. So no matter whatever you're doing, you can have as much talent as you have. You can have all the talent in the world. Um, However, if you don't have character, you're not going to endure any of the hardships that come your way. And the cool thing about character is that we can build it. Mm. Um, and we build it through adversity. Uh, we build it through the tough times. Um, and we learn from those tough times. We, instead of using the tough times as an excuse or a blame or a woe me, we look at the adversity and the tough time and we're like, well, what did I learn from that? What can I take forward with me? How can this situation grow me? Um, so that's one of them. And to be flexible. So I know that you guys as part of your character um, program is that change readiness is important. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So adaptability and flexibility is key. Life is not going to just be one straight line and you're not going to get everything that you want at the time that you want it. Yeah. Um, you need to be a bit adaptable and flexible. You need to be able to change. You need to be able to find workarounds. Um, you need to do it a hundred times and on the hundred and first time you'll get it right probably. Yeah. Um, so it's all those abilities. And the only way that we, um, we create our character is by building it brick by brick, day by day. Um, for me as a boxer, I didn't actually ever believe that I would be an athlete, okay? I was a 12-year-old girl watching the 1996 Olympics, and it was in Barcelona, and Penny Haynes was a swimmer from South Africa, and she won two golds in the swimming pool for breaststroke. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. I, should be a, I could be a swimmer and go to the Olympics. And then in the very next breath, I was like, don't be ridiculous. Look at you, you're too tall, you're too skinny, you've got no muscles, like, who do you think you are? Um, and so for a long time, I had just dismissed the idea of being an athlete. I walked into a boxing gym, I fell in love with it. Again, there was no intention to be the athlete. 
But what happened along the way was it was a little bit of character building, definitely character building and stretching me in terms of courage and comfort zones. Um, I was pushing every aspect of my mental fortitude and physical abilities. Um, and I was like, right, okay, well, what, what, are you, what are you doing here? I was like, well, I'm just going to try and be better than I was yesterday. That's all I'm going to try and do. It's just that one little brick, tiny, mm. tiny brick slightly better than you were yesterday and then i woke up one day and i was about eight years later and i was like okay so now i'm an i'm an athlete like what's this <laughs> thing like you're an athlete how did this happen it's it's small steps so character building is small tiny steps and you might not see the difference in a week but you'll see it in a year or even six months um but sticking to tiny increments don't compare yourself to other people have compassion for yourself um you're not gonna be perfect you're always gonna make mistakes but if you have the ability to be compassionate towards yourself for your mistakes and your learnings but also um compassion in terms of why do you want to be your biggest bully like when did bullying get anything done productively no it's never has um, you're going to shy away from it all the time. So how about you just be your biggest cheerleader to get you wherever you're going? Um, yeah, I think. I think that's good. a really, I mean, that's almost could be the title of your next book, uh, Alexis, you know, don't be your own bully. I think that's really powerful and that's something people, um, will certainly remember from that. That's great. Um, with regard to, I mean, we see you or people have seen you as, you know, Alexis on the podium. Uh, winning New Zealand titles, uh, winning um, uh, medals at the Commonwealth Games, going to the Olympics. And we see the edited highlights sometimes of, of the best bits almost, which is, which is great. Um, but you have mentioned earlier um, about the tough times are where your character really, A, it got built and B, it got really tested. Yeah. Um, what are some of the advice or guidance you could give? I mean, you don't have to allude to your own mm. tough times. Um, but when people do feel that they may be in that area where they, they can't see the wood for the trees or they do feel like everything is going wrong or they've failed, you know, 99 times out of 100, what are some of the things you've had to do or you do currently where you go, you know what, um, I'm going to use my character here or um, I'm going to use this as a learning mechanism? How do you do that when things seems so tough or they seem so difficult yeah that's a great question i hopefully don't go off on a tangent here because my brain's going ding 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 uh, um <laughs> so i will share like one of my biggest tests on the international stage or for me my biggest what i thought was a humiliation i'm maybe not an humiliation but an embarrassment was the 2014 Commonwealth Games in Glasgow. Um, so I was part of the first 34 female athletes to go to a London, to go to the Olympics. So that was London. And then two years later, they had the first bout of athletes at the Commonwealth Games. And I was one of the favorites. There was a girl from England, Natasha Jonas and I, and we were the favorites. And I'd been training with her for three weeks before in Sheffield, and I was getting the better of her and I was just like, yeah, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be absolutely amazing. Um, got to the games, everything was going well. The draw comes out and I face Valencia Spencer from the Dominica Republic. And I was like, who is this chick? I don't know who she is. Never heard of her. She's from South America. I'm going to kick her butt. Um, and I also went along the draw and I was like, right, so uh natasha's gonna face so and so shelly's gonna face so and so and i'm gonna meet either natasha or shelly in the final so my brain my head was far in the future mm. where it needed to be with me in the present fighting okay so i fight 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 comes up fight day i'm feeling great first three first two rounds are going swimmingly it's mine my two rounds third round she comes out and she just absolutely goes hard like I was just like, what, where's this coming from? This is not supposed to happen. This is not supposed to happen. This is not how the story goes. This is not what we intended. Mm. And I panicked. 
and I just continued to panic for that whole round and I couldn't get anything off properly. She was getting more dominance. And by the third, fourth round, she was, I was still in panic bill. Um, and she won the fight. And I, that was, I came 10th overall, I think. Now in the grand scheme of things, yeah, I know making a Commonwealth Games is an amazing thing and coming 10th is amazing too. Um, I just had different outcomes or different intentions. I had goals. I had bigger goals than where I ended up. But for me, it wasn't really that, the fact that I came 10th. It was the fact that I'd let myself down um, in the way that I had prepared. I had prepared focusing on an outcome rather than prepared focusing on a performance because we all know that when we focus on an outcome, our brain's far in the future and our body doesn't know what it's supposed to be doing. So the after the after a few days of feeling pretty sorry for myself after that i had to sit down and reflect on what happened what went wrong what went right what did i learn so that is part of the process is like you can't do it in the when all those emotions are really high and raw you've got to give it a few days so give it a few days after the thing that happened that was tough and tragic. Even if it's a month of tra tragedy, give it some time, yeah. then sit down and reflect. Talk to someone if you need to about yeah. what happened. What did you learn? What can you take forward? Ask yourself, is this how I'm going to leave it? Can I do better? Am I gonna back myself to learn from these mistakes? Or am I going to decide to sit down and not get up? Those are questions that you can that you should need to ask of yourself, and that's definitely definitely about courage. Um, do I have the courage to get back up and try this thing again, even though I have no control of the outcome? Do I have courage to back myself to try and change what I did? Mm -hmm. So that was one of the big things that people could see i'm not sure if they viewed it in that way because obviously it was a very uh that's a story that was going on inside of my head um but that could have been a moment that broke me as an athlete mm. i could have just sat down and i was like oh this is too much too hard not good enough yep. i'm not good enough but i was like no i will not let um i will not finish a career like this mm. this is not the way yep. i can do better and my learnings were don't focus on the outcome focus on the performance yeah yeah now i feel like I, there's more to the answer of this thing but i've lost sight of the question a little bit but i feel like that, that was <laughs> oh, a, right. that, that was, was great, half that, of the yeah, that, that was a great answer the... <laughs> yeah yeah no i mean there was enough there for a lot of people to get out of um the, the question was sort of around um you know those tough moments and and digging deep um and how you use that to yeah okay bring yourself back to the fore so. and then you also you also need to i think take perspective of you as an individual but also you in your collective family mm. take account of your history what is your history telling you? Where do you come from? What kind of people are, are your people? You know, for me, I come from South Africa. My family lived through apartheid. My mom was a badass and fought for freedoms of other people. My grandparents, they have stories in there too about, you know, fighting oppression. Um, being dirt poor and still finding a way through. So that, what is that? What does my history tell me? My history tells me that I'm a fighter. Yeah. My history tells me that I will get up and I will continue to, to continue on, even if times are tough. Now, yeah, some of our history, we have shady history. That's all of us. Okay. So don't be afraid of the shade. Um, don't only walk towards the light, but look at the shade and be like, well, actually, I don't want that as part of my journey now. So I'm going to do things differently so that the shade's not part of who I am. I'm going to take the light forward, but I'm going to change direction for the shade. So it's, it's about looking back. Who are you? Where do you come from? What do your people stand for? 
are you going to continue that legacy on or are you going to um, duck out of it? Um, so that would be the other thing is look back and see what your people are made of. Cause it's not only about you, you bring generations of hardships with you and all your people got through those hardships. Yep. So therefore you can get through the hardship too. Um, yeah. But make sure that you reflect, pause to reflect and what can you learn? Mm. And I think the other thing for me is that I've never thought of failure as it's not black and white and it's also doesn't mean that i'm a failure just because the thing that i did didn't work out doesn't mean that i'm a failure and i and i don't know where i learned that skill from it's definitely a skill of people who become successful is that they learn how to fail and they learn how to take the lessons from yeah. every failure they fail forward and they fail fast the more failure you can do, the better, actually, because then you know all the ways not to do it. Yeah. Um, so failure is important. Um, it grows you and it teaches you a new way. And for me, I just have always gone, okay, brush it off, learn, move on. Yeah. It's funny, in our household, my husband, who's my coach, who was my coach, he is um, a guy that hates losing, like absolutely hates losing for himself as an athlete and for as a coach. And so losses were really hard. And he was always intrigued by my ability to just brush it off. And he felt like I wasn't invested enough in what I was doing because I wouldn't go into a deep, dark hole after every loss. And look, I've had 142 fights and I would say 65% of those were loss, were, were wins. So what? I failed 45%, if not more. Yep. Yeah. And I was like, well, what's the point of wallowing? I've got to learn from this. That's the only way you move forward is learning from those mm -hmm. failures. So fail forward and fail fast. Yeah. yeah. Learn. Yeah. I think that was such a, a great way of um, finishing that question. And this sense of um, having a sense of your own family identity and history is something that we certainly for some of our boys, it's quite easy to forget or neglect. You know, we, we sometimes fixate on the, you know, the, the work in the gym or the work in the, the classroom or what, whatever the context may be. But having a, an idea of that, that backstory is, is very powerful and finding those yeah. people and those role models to lean on when, when the tough times come. Yeah. Um, I think that's a, a really good exercise that some, some of our boys could do. So thank yeah. you very much. For, I think that was a, such a good answer. Very welcome. And also guys, life is tough. Life is a struggle. That's just, that's just it. And if you can't find your way through it, you're going to be sitting down for a lot of it. Um, yeah. It's, it's my impression of life. There's always, there's greatness, but there's also struggle. There's so yeah. much struggle. Yeah. 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 And at the moment, you know, we were all sort of feeling it at the moment as well. So that's really prevalent and topical. <laughs> um, just a couple of things, um, and we don't want to keep you too long, Lex. We know you probably would have done 20 minutes if it was the, the mother son breakfast. Oh, no, I've, this I've is had so, you here for I, about 40 I'm, hours. Really, I'm um, really enjoying talking. I love talking. <laughs> um, what I would just a couple of things to touch upon um, is just around transition. So, you've transitioned from you know, being an athlete, highly structured environment, um, a lot of things catered for in terms of your training, and now you're Alexis, sort of. A retired athlete, um, ex-athlete. And I just want to, if you've got any um, thoughts or feelings around transitions, a lot of our boys will be transitioning from high school soon to university or to a job or um, even just the transition between, you know, I was a, I was a junior and now I'm going to be a senior. Um, mm. We're always in a, in a state of um, transitioning from one thing to the next. Um, and it can be quite hard to give up something that you were doing and pick up something new yeah. um, how have you found that going from like I say a highly successful Olympian um, Commonwealth medalist to now some of the other things you're doing which are great as well but such a big part of your identity changing mm -hmm. um, any tips or techniques for some of our boys who may be going things through things similar um, at the moment or in the very near future for them yeah so transition is a really interesting thing and I didn't think that it was going to hit me as hard as it did. 
because I had a lot of things in place already. So I wasn't a full-time athlete. I had a full-time job and I was an athlete on the side. Um, So I was like, oh, I'm going to be fine. Also, I had two businesses that I was running at that time. And I was like, oh, I'm going to be absolutely fine. I've, I've got my education. Everything is sorted. Like I am a whole person. I know that I'm a whole person already without, um, I'm not just Alexis the boxer. And so I found it really interesting that I still had a tough transition. Um, but then you have to look at things and you be like, of course you had a tough, tough transition. You were an athlete for 16 years and now you've stopped doing that thing. So whether you're transitioning out of high school or from a junior to a senior or, you know, you were injured and you can't play the sport that you want to play this season it's still a little bit of a transition isn't it um what i had to acknowledge was that there is an aspect of grief um and that you need to allow yourself to work through that um don't i would advise you or encourage you not to push it away if you push it away it's just going to come back later in a different time so just deal with it now deal with those uncomfortable yucky feelings right now understand that it is a an emotional roller coaster as well like you if you were if you've gone if you're going from high school to university you have been with your mates for five years like you see them every day like they know you in and out and now you're going to university and you don't know you don't know anyone that's a whole new environment you're at the bottom there's like a thousand of you in one lecture room no one cares about you you know like honestly (laughs) um versus you were one of the top athletes or the top scholars and people knew your name so like you were kind of important and yeah you are important guys you are important um but you're also in the big world you're just one of another so transition is about grief and you just grieve you just understand that you are going to feel yucky for a while um but in that time don't just sit down and cry about it find a mentor uh, a mentor that can help guide you if you don't have a mentor already whether it's a sport mentor or a coach or an adult that you can confide in and talk to and they can help guide you through a situation I, i would really encourage you to do that even as a 35 year old woman i have a couple of mentors that i go to when things are tough and i'm like this is going on what are your thoughts? This is what I'm thinking. And they'll be like, yep, that's great. Or even just to have a chat about it. Yeah. So as an athlete transitioning out, I reached out to the New Zealand Olympic committee and I asked, and I said, look, this is my intention for the next five years. Can you guide me in some way? And they were like, we can, we've got this on this person that you can talk to. So find a mentor. And that really helped me gain some new direction um and for me as an athlete one of the big things that i did was i w- i announced my retirement when i was ready right. a lot of athletes they unfortunately the media retires them or their sport retires them and that's not a nice feeling that happened to me in 2016 after my really short retirement and uh, a, a news reporter or journalist retired me in the newspaper and I woke up one morning and I was retired I was like whoa how did we we, who who said that um so announcing my retirement was a very important part of my journey having control of that decision um but just know that you're going to get through it you also want to have support around you so your parents your friends lean on them it's about leaning on your community it's not about you going through this thing on your own um have them be part of the journey to help you go through that tough time um yeah so understand this grief get a mentor lean on people um open up and be vulnerable let people in you don't have to be a tough guy at all yeah brilliant that that was my transition thank you alexis that was such a a powerful way um to answer that question um what are the the kind of uh, the last thing and i I won't keep you for much longer the last thing i want to mention is you know if you could um if you could go back to that you know that 12 year old who moved to new zealand and 
through all of the experiences you've had, um, and this will be something our boys hopefully can take, what are the one or two or three bits of crucial advice that you wish you'd known then um, mm -hmm. that, you, that you know now? What, what sort of advice would you give that younger version of yourself? The stories that you tell yourself are not true, or a lot of them are not true. Uh, so the stories that you tell yourself, <laughs> really investigate them. Um, you are good enough. For me, that was a big one. Um, the idea of not being good enough, just generally. Um, so you are good enough. And uh, what would we, I think those two, those two things are big things, aren't they? Um, I don't necessarily have a third one. That's okay. Yeah. Two will, two will do. Two good ones are better than <laughs> better than anything. Um, Alexis, I think, and that's a great place to to push pause on this and and stop that. I think the level of detail and emotion and um, wisdom and the richness of your responses there are really things that our boys and their families can take. So. Thank you so much for the answers you've given. It was really thoughtful of you to, to, to do this for us. And I know that a lot of people are very thankful um, and hopefully we'll get a lot of people watching this. So from all of us at Westlake Boys, Alexis, thank you so much. Um, we hopefully will get you in person soon, sooner rather than later. But um, for now, I don't think we could have done that any better. So again, thank you. Um, normally what would happen now is our headmaster, Mr. Ferguson, would get up, he would thank um, the speaker, <laughs> And he would always say, right, boys, before you go to class, you need to walk your mum out of the building. You need to give her, a, um, give her a kiss, give her a cuddle, get her in the car, and then you can go to class. But you have to tell her that you love her. So we can't do all of that um, at the moment because um, you're not here, obviously. But it would be lovely now if you could just turn to whoever you've watched this with and, um, yeah, tell your mum you love her or go and make her breakfast or whatever you need to do just to show them how much um, they are appreciated. So um, that would be a nice tradition if we could carry that on, even if it is something um, a little bit different to how we normally do it. Or Lex, I don't know if you've got any ideas that someone could do for their mum right now as this, as this video draws to a close. Um, I think so. Yeah, you definitely tell your mum that you love her, but also say why. Like give her the whys behind the love or the appreciation, like that would be really nice too. One or two things of why you love her or why you appreciate her. Brilliant, thank you very much. I don't think that could go on. Um, that last little bit about tell them why is so special and so important. Thank you again. Um, we've, or oh, I've really enjoyed this. I know a lot of people who listen to this are going to as well, Lex. So um, it's been a pleasure. And we thank wish you. you well with, we wish you well with <laughs> your businesses and everything you're gonna go on to achieve, so. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you so much, guys.